feed forward and feed back control. So the diagram that I've shown you, it's on the screen right now, is known as a feedback control loop, right? And it's called a feedback control loop because of this uh, connection where the controller moves things, makes manipulations on these manipulated variables on the plant. It then observes what happened. And you can see there's this kind of a forward part so we call the forward part the, the causally forward part. In other words, if I change the valve, something will change on the outside. And you may remember that you had difficulty with this in CPN, with this idea of understanding what causes what. And so you need to always imagine that if you were able to identify the causal inputs in CPN, in other words, if you could look at a thing and say, well, it's the valve that makes the flow change not the flow that makes the valve change. You'll be on pretty solid ground already, right? So if you, you have to kind of have an idea of what is the causal direction. So you have to think about, in the world, how does uh, causality work? What affects what? Another way of thinking about this, the classic example here, is if I have, if I have something like a, like a bath, right? So I have a bath, and I've got like my big uh, bath faucet there with uh, these taps, and there's water coming out there. It's, if I'm looking at that bath, if I'm filling that up, I can't say the level is causing more water to come out of the faucet, right? That would never happen. You can, if, if you just took a snapshot and you saw it a little bit later and you saw that there was more level, you wouldn't reason that way around because that's not how the world works. In the same way, there's no way to pull on the water to make the valves go open more, right? You open the valves and then more water comes out. Does that make sense? So that's the direction of causality. And that's how you identify which things are manipulated variables and which things are targets or possible controlled variables, right? So it's, it's these things, I can change the valve. But I can't change the level. And what I mean by can't here is, and I'm going to go quite slowly on this idea because it is a bit subtle, because especially it becomes even more subtle when we start doing math about this, right? But what I mean by this is you as a person could reach out your hand and rotate that valve and cause more water to come out. But there's nothing that you could do in an immediate sense, right, with your hands to change the level of your bath, right? When I say immediate here... If you're thinking, yes, but I can change the level, I can pull out the plug, or I can change the valve, or whatever, that's indirect, <coughs> right? So what I'm talking about here is this causal direction is the direct direction. It's like if I were to choose to reach out my hand and change something, I could change the position of the valve immediately. But there's no direct way. I couldn't reach in and move the level of the water, right? It's, that is a secondary effect. It only happens downstream from the valve change. Okay? This is what we'll be calling the forward direction. So if the plant were my bath, if I were trying to maintain the temp or reach, have my bath get to a certain level, I would be changing, manipulating the valves on my bath. I would be observing the level, and then I would be taking action once the level had gotten to my desired level again. I would have cha I, I change it back. That's how the world works. And that's the key about thinking about feedback. Because feedback goes, let's say, opposite to the causal flow of information. And why it's subtle is, in a very real sense, when that controller is enabled, there is an influence from the level back to the valve. Right? Because I just said it. I'll look, and when the level reaches a certain level, I'll make a change. 
So in a very real sense, all the math tells me, if, if, I were look, if I didn't know there was a person involved, if I were just looking at variables moving on the screen, I could really say, oh, it's the level. It's when the level reached that desired level, that's when the valve stopped. Okay? And it's important to understand that there's this difference. The causality exists encoded into the world only. The math never tells us about the causality. We can't look at the math and say, oh, yes, because of the math, that's why the causality is the way it is. We can't even look at the data, right? So if I were to plot, if I were just to say, let's say I were to plot this, and I had my level here, and I had my valve fraction over here, right? And let's say some, at some initial time, I open up the valve, and the level starts filling up, and then I see... At some later point, the level reaches its destination and the valve closes down. Do you see, from looking at that, I don't have a clear way of knowing that it isn't the other way around, that you, you could look at the, those data and say, oh, I see what happened. As soon as the level reached that point, the valve closed down. That's a reasonable interpretation of the data. If you didn't have the picture, and you didn't have your knowledge about how physics works and like how the world works, you wouldn't be able to tell. Did the valve close because somebody else decided to close it and then the level stopped? Or did the level stop, or the, did the level reaching that point cause the um, valve to close? So, and remember, when we have our controllers in operation, that loop goes all the way around, right? The controller is looking at the measurement, it's making decisions, and it's actually changing things. So there's, when the loop is closed, when the controller is making decisions, <laughs> executing those decisions, the system is responding to those uh, manipulations, producing new measurements, which is used by the controller, there's no start to a circle, right? That's very zen. So like, if you just look at the diagram, like, there's no way for you to, to kind of uncover what's forward and back. And so the convention, and this is something I'm... I'm I'm finding it like I'm going really slow on this, but I know. I'm going to go even slower next year because I know there's going to be a lot of people who just don't really get it. They don't understand the feed forward, why we use forward and why we use back. And the best thing I can tell you is most of the time when we talk about forward, we're talking about causal chain, right? Using things that are only going forward in causality. When we talk about backwards in loops and in control, we're talking about things that go against the physics causality chain. Now, this becomes very important because probably the easiest way that you can imagine control to work, if you think about what the controller's job is, if I tell you the controller's job is to take a signal and if I'm building a transfer function for this, this is the controller, this is the plant. And on a very simple level, I could imagine that the controller's job is to say, if this thing does some kind of weird shape, the best kind of controller would make that same shape happen. So if, the, if I'm trying to put in a target, if I'm writing some kind of thing where I would, you could imagine writing a little program where you have a car, and you draw a little path. I think everybody's seen those toys that you can get where you can kind of build out a path and the car's job is to kind of move along that path. So it's got a target and if it's doing its job right, it's just on the target, right? And so does everybody see that it is theoretically possible, given your knowledge of transfer function math, to say, okay, that could be all we have. If we talk about doing the math, we just say, if, if our goal is to have the reference to be equal to y, right, so that's a perfect controller. I'm just going to call this, the, the book uses YSP, but you, you'll see reference is also a widely used uh, symbol. So a perfect control is those things must be equal to one, one another. So what does that mean? For perfect control, given only the blocks that I have on the screen here, right, uh, GC, GP must be equal to 1, if we're talking about transfer functions. 
Does that make sense? Right, so that's, that's how I would make that happen. And what that means is I can basically solve for this beautiful perfect controller by just solving that equation. So I can just say, so uh, GC must just be 1 over GP. Well, this is an easy subject. Right, there you go. Problem solved. I have a system. If I want to make a controller for that system, if I have an inverse of the system available, that inverse will tell me exactly what I should do with my, rep, with my manipulated variables in order to achieve the output that I uh, want to achieve. So let's work through this. Let's think about this from a uh, CPN kind of level. Let's imagine that uh, GP is equal to 2 over 3s plus 1. Right? So just a first order transfer function, super easy. And given that equation, um, I'll end up with GC is equal to uh, 3s plus 1 over 2. And then my job is done and everything is fine. And now just, I, the only thing is I just have to build one of these. And so when I start using those words, um, I'm hoping that somebody is going to put up their hands and say, but wait a minute, you can't build one of those. Does everybody understand why? There's this little pesky thing called physical realizability, which we spoke about last year in CPN. Do you remember that? This was this idea that you cannot build a perfect differential unit. And because you can't build a perfect differential unit, you cannot build something with a transfer function that is effectively just S. Right? Because S is the transfer function of a perfect derivative unit. Now, I would need, if you think about it, I would need to build a thing that could actually be S if I wanted to build one of those. Right? Because this is, this is just 3 over 2 S plus uh, 1 over 2. Right? So, that's the problem. Right there. I can't build one of those. Because I can't build one of those, this idea doesn't work. Now, this idea is called feed-forward control. You'll see, conveniently, that it follows that kind of left-to-right strategy. And it follows this idea that I tell the controller I want to do this. The controller decides I'm going to make a plan and do that. And then it just happens. And we stop there. And this doesn't work. It just absolutely doesn't work. Not because of any other problem than practically you cannot build a differential unit. Now, I want to just point out there are kind of two parts of physical realizability, right? The first one is you can't build a differential unit. The second one is you can't look into the future. And so if I were to extend this transfer function with like a date time, Right? I would end up with a date time over there. And if you think about what that would be, is I just have to build a machine that is capable of looking three seconds into the future. Right? Which again, as near as we can tell within the constraints of our universe, uh, that is not possible. So inverse-based controllers, these kinds of controllers are Let's say, the most obvious version of control. I tell you what I want to achieve. You use your knowledge of the model to make a plan. You execute the plan, and it happens. And so we already have this problem. The plan is not perfect. right? Or it's, it's impossible to make a perfect plan. Let's summarize it that way. The other problem with this, and this this idea, this idea is exactly what feedforward control is based around. Now, it's in the textbook not because it's like such a silly idea, but because it is actually a clever idea. The key idea, though, is that we can only do this approximately. Okay, so while we cannot, in typical cases, invert the system exactly, because most systems are, if you remember a little bit of terminology from, from last year, most systems are strictly proper, right? 
And so strictly proper systems, by definition, what, that, what those words mean is there's more S's below the line than above the line. And if you couple that with this nasty physical realizability thing, which says like you can't make something with more S's above the line than below the line, right? If a physically proper, if a, a physical system is proper, more S's below the line, its inverse is going to have more S's above the line, which means most systems don't have realizable inverses. And that's really kind of the problem with control of this simple nature. Um, now I'm not 100% sure, I'm actually recording this to put up to the YouTube channel, but I'm not 100% sure whether I'm going to be able to actually do this recording. But I want to describe, you're going to be a little bit interactive now. Um, can I just have, who knows how to drive a car? Okay, so it's, it, there's enough participation. Is I want you all to close your eyes. Okay, I want you all to close your eyes. And pretend that you're driving your car, or a car, right? Keep your hands in front of you on the steering wheel. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, at this point, you're just riding along on the highway, straight and steady, okay? And I want you to execute a lane change to your left. So I want you to just change to the lane on your left. You've got your hands in front of you, you've moved the steering wheel to the left and then you've moved it back to the center position. At this point you are moving diagonally across the highway. <laughs> right? Does everybody agree? Most of you got this wrong. There were one or two people who did the opposite because you've got a turn which will turn you. At that point you're moving diagonally across, you're now moving towards that other lane. And then you have to execute a counterclockwise uh, turn to get back in the lane. Now the wonderful thing about how the world works, you remember yesterday I explained that the world is filled with feedback loops. Because very few of you have ever found yourself traveling diagonally across the highway and just like carelessly driving into the ditch on the side. Why? Because there's a feed forward part, there's a part of your brain that is making move planning, that's saying, right, I want to get into the other lane. At that point, your brain switches off and it passes off the task to the, I just want to stay moving in the right direction in my lane part of your brain, which is using feedback. And it's that part which is largely unconscious, which is actually responsible for getting you back into the lane. So you, you make the turn, and the correction happens effectively autonomously. You don't really think about it. This is the power of feedback. If I, this is why we can't drive, so I, I have, this is a nice illustration because it's quite visual, but the same thing goes with, have you ever thought about why is it so hard to write with your eyes closed? You know how to write. All of you write all the time, right? It's super hard to write with your eyes closed. Why? It's not hard to type with your eyes closed. If, I mean, if you know how to type, right? Like if, you, if you're good at typing, you can type with, with your eyes closed, no problem, right? But you can't write with your eyes closed no matter how well you write. Why? Because most of what you're doing when you're writing isn't you making a decision to make those shapes, it's you watching the shapes happen on the paper and making corrections as you go. Right? That's why it looks so messed up if you don't see it. Because the part that's on the page is just this bad inverse. Right? It's you deciding to move your hand in the way that you kind of remember that it should move to make those letters. That's what feed forward control is like. Right? Like it's writing without your eyes. The same, I can go on for ages, right? Same thing with darts. Who's ever thrown darts, right? If you throw darts, how well do you think you'll do if you throw 10 darts but you don't look at where you, where you end up? Right, so you just set up and you're like, I'm going to throw this dart but I blindfold you. And you just throw 10 darts, right? Compare that to the same thing but without the blindfold. Why is that easier? Or why is it easier to get closer to the target if you have your eyes open? Because you can see what happened, right? The controller here, this controller, that's taking in a command, doing some planning, writing out a note, and handing it to the process, and saying, right, that's your instructions, just do it. That's feed-forward control. 
no feedback, no checking, no, wait a minute, did that actually work the way I thought it would work? No, oh geez, I'm actually traveling across the lane, maybe I should like change it so that I'm actually in my lane. Nothing, because it's not looking at what it's doing. Right? In order to look what you're doing, you have to have feedback. And so this is where we end up with this feedback loop, right? It's the classic because it's the thing that we need to make things work. We have to look where we're going. We have to look what happened once we made a change in order for us to have effective control. Okay, so now that you understand and you would have come across this very, it's a confusing concept. It takes like it's one paragraph in the textbook. People always struggle with it, but this is the crux of feed forward and feedback, right? Feed forward is the naive way. It says, you tell me what to do, I use my math, I use the model of the process or whatever that I've written down, and I calculate the thing that I must do to make the outcome happen. Feedback doesn't do that at all. It just says, well, I'm going to keep changing until I get there. I'm going to make a change, and if that wasn't enough, I'll make a bigger change. And if that still wasn't enough, I'll make a bigger change yet. And I'll keep doing that until I get there. And then if I get there, I'll maybe put my foot on the, on the brake. So it's a completely different idea. We are going to dig into the math of feedback control uh, in this subject. But I, want you to, I wanted to do this exercise with you to warn you. It's very alluring, this idea of feed-forward control, because it has the most in common with the way that you've solved problems in other subjects. Right? In other subjects, you have equations, you have a model, right? You have some goal that you want to achieve. Design a flash drum such that the flow rate of whatever is whatever. What should the feed flow rate be? That's a CIR question or a CMO question, right? And the CMO version of that question, which we're doing without control, says, I've got my flash drum. I've got some specifications, I've got my data, right? I've got my enthalpy diagram and everything, and I've got my isotherm, and then I work out what is F so that I get these numbers that I've been asked to give, right? That is an easy, straightforward problem to solve mathematically. But it is 100% guaranteed to give you the wrong answer when you do it on site. Why is this? We, we just did a little bit of the, the, the answer in the dynamics, because actually, let me just, it, it bears saying, the problem with causality is dynamics. Does everybody see that if I didn't have dynamics, if there weren't differential equations, this problem would be fine? Right, so, so at steady state, where S becomes zero, this reduces down right, to just uh, 2, and then this reduces down to a half. And that's fine. There's nothing stopping me from inverting just normal numbers. So the problem with realizability has everything to do with I can't do that over time. I can do it eventually. I can solve my equations and get there eventually, but I can't do it over time, okay? So that's the first concern with feed-forward control is uninvertibility or, let's say, the problem with physical realizability of the inverse. But the second problem is, even if I'm working at steady state, even if I go back to my CMO books and I go and get that flash drum example and I work it out perfectly, it won't work. Why? So I want you to commit this to memory. This is like I'm starting to call this like the Sandrock statement of control. I want to have this put onto like a little plaque in my office. Look at that statement. And I want you to repeat that to yourself as a mantra as we go through. And this is even more important. You'll hear me repeat this again during your final year design initial lecture. Does this make sense to anybody? So here's what I'm saying. I'm saying you design your process in Aspen. You build it out. You use the most up-to-date data that you can find, right? You design that flash drum. 
you get the problem right 100% in the exam. Okay? You take that plan, you send it for manufacture, you get the thing back, you build everything, you put the valves in, you put everything, you operate and all the gauges are showing you perfectly exactly the thing that you designed for, right? You're running at the right pressure, you're running at the right temperature, but you are not obtaining the outputs that you have designed for. Why? Everything is perfectly controlled. Or what I'm saying, like you've insulated it perfectly, it's not some weird, this is not a trick question as such. I suppose there's a bit of a trick in it, but it's not like, it's not like this thing that you never thought of. It's this other thing that you never thought of, which is, if you, <laughs> which, I want you to tell you, I want you to go in small steps through the design process. All the design process this, that you've actually done, every real design that you've done. You did uh, heat exchanger design last year, right? Okay, so let's go through the steps. Carl says, I want you to design a heat exchanger that will be able to cool a certain amount of feed from 100 degrees Celsius down to 20 degrees Celsius. I give you the properties of the feed and all of that kind of stuff and assume that that, you can even assume that that's right, okay? So you've got water, you want to cool this 100 degree water down to 20 degrees. You do your energy balance, you work out how much water you will need. You work with Q is equal to A, uh, Q equals UA delta T. You work out what the area is that you want. You calculate, you figure out what kind of passes you want and baffles you want and all of that kind of stuff. And at some point, you multiply by 1.2. Does that sound familiar? Right? Near the end, once you know exactly what you need, you make it bigger. Right? Okay? So what ends up being delivered on site? Is it the original heat exchanger that exactly achieved the design conditions? Or is it a slightly larger heat exchanger, which if you operate it just like you designed it, actually cools the water down more? It's that second one, right? You do that with heat exchangers, you take reactors. What happens? You design your perfect reactor, right? You've got your reaction rates, you work it out, you target a conversion of 90%, you figure out you need this kind of residence time, you work with the amount of flow rate that you do. At some point, you say, you know what, like, just multiply by 1.5, give me a bigger tank. So what happens? You actually get much better conversion, right, than your original design. You designed for 90% conversion, but then you multiplied by 1.5, so you get out 95% conversion. Why? Because you've got a bigger reactor. It's bigger than the one you, than you originally designed. Okay, so now you can say, oh, but Carl, no, no, I'm super sophisticated. I put that back into my design, right? I, know I designed originally for these minimums, but I multiplied by 1.5, and I multiplied by 1.2, and I did all those multiplications, and then I went and I re-simulated the whole system to know what actually will happen. Right? Bravo. Most people don't do that, but I know you guys are all above average. So um, the above average people are working out those new points. But there's a second problem. Right? Even when you turn all your keys and the thing starts and... Lo and behold, it actually does exactly what you thought. Then next day, your uh, plates have fouled a little bit. Or uh, the catalyst that you're using has become slightly uh, poisoned. And so you're not getting quite the conversion that you, that you originally thought. You're not even getting the conversion that you had that you made a note of right at the beginning when you installed everything. It's a little bit different than it was. Right? So, this mantra I want to remind everybody because it's a very common idea that people imagine, oh wait, all I have to do is make sure that I operate the plant the way I designed it. And then it will work just the way I designed it. But actually nothing in life works that way. I have an old Mini which no longer produces the horsepower that it produced when I bought it. If my strategy for operating at a particular speed was operating at a particular angle of my petrol pedal, I would be going 20% slower all the time. But I'm not going 20% slower all the time. My foot is 20% lower all the time. Why? Because I'm not worried about what the design said. I'm worried about what actually happened. What, what matters to me is what's on the speed, uh, speed gauge. What happens over here, same thing. I could work it all out, work out my isotherms, get everything, Set this exactly where I want. And now, by the way, if you are in the habit of 
like just taking apart your home appliance, you'll notice that uh, mass-produced home, home appliances do sometimes have this kind of design nature. So if you have a fridge, for instance, uh, most refrigeration cycles will have a physical, just like a, a cinch in the line for the expansion valve. They won't actually be like a valve. They'll just be somebody like clamp the clamp the wire with a, or the clamp the tube with a with a clamp, right? That's as close as as it gets. And they've perfected that unit over many iterations, so that now they kind of know exactly how to design it. And so I'm not saying that it's impossible to design things well. It's incredibly hard. And for most practical chemical engineering systems, they are one off. So we can't just build one and see if that worked, and then build another one and see if that worked, and then build another one and see if that worked, because we'll run out of money. So for our systems, almost always, we are going to say, you know what, I'm just going to check. I'm going to measure what exactly is happening over here. And I'm going to have a controller that tries to make that happen. Now, the last thing I want to say about feed forward and feedback. Now, this sounds like such a long lecture about feed forward and feedback, but I'm hoping that I'm, by this lecture, going to disarm all the further discussions that we're going to have about feed forward and feedback, um, which is about the difference between the way that physical ma uh, matter moves in the system and the way that information moves in the system. The, the, the textbook has this wonderful example, um, which actually I'm going to use, I think you're going to do one of them as a tut problem, so I'm going to use a slightly different example. So, a little bit further down, we're going to have this example of a steam boiler. Okay? So, a steam boiler's job, let's say it's like, Operating with uh, with the arc or something like that. It's like an arc furnace, arc boiler. So there's like energy coming in there, and the job of this boiler there's water coming in here, and the job of this boiler is to produce steam. Okay, and so this boiler sits at the start of the plant. It's like a big thing that sits there and feeds all the things that need to be heated up. And so there's a lot of different consumers on this side. Right? And we can put in energy and we can put in makeup water over here. And so you can imagine that we could actually uh, imagine that the steam that is being used is actually an input into the system. Does that make sense to everybody? It's weird because the arrows go the other way. That's why I'm writing down this example now, right? What is happening, and this is very much like, let's say, if you have something like a car, if you press down on the petrol pedal, typically there are actually, there's like a little controller in a modern car, there's like a little electronic controller that then actually gives you more petrol. It used to be that was like a physical valve and you were just opening the valve. But these days it's more like I'm asking for more petrol and then I'll get more petrol from the controller. These steam users, so somebody downstream opens that valve and that lowers the pressure in my steam boiler. Does that make sense? Why? Because it's a gas. And this is just how gases can work, right? A downstream valve opening up can reduce the pressure in my, uh, in my vessel. So it's important to understand that I could use a feed-forward strategy here, but the feed-forward strategy would look on the, on the physical diagram like it's going backwards. Why? Because I would measure the steam, control, and then maybe change the amount of energy, right? So if, if the steam gets more, if, so, if people start using more steam, I can push more energy into the system. And it is important to understand that this, what I've drawn there, is a feed-forward strategy. Is that making sense to everybody? Why? It becomes clear, right, 
when I draw the block diagram to show the causality of things, right? It's important to understand that in this system, adding more energy will not produce more steam. Adding more energy will increase the pressure of the vessel. In other words, it won't cause more steam to go out of the vessel. It will just increase the pressure of the vessel. Why? Because the downstream units are consuming steam at a rate that they choose. Does this make sense? So, it's the steam... Actually, let me just write this down. So, you've got a steam uh, flow. Steam flow causes a reduction in pressure. Right? And then energy causes a increase in pressure. So this is if you think about the causal diagram of this. If I have those two inputs, in other words, I can change the amount of steam, and what will happen is more steam will go out, which will reduce the pressure. And I can increase the amount of energy that I put in, and that will not change the steam flow rate. It will just change the pressure in my, in my drum. Does that make sense to you? And so can you see that the causal forward direction goes forward from steam flow and from energy? Even though the material is flowing, if you look at the diagram in terms of physical components, it looks like it should be causally linked so that when I add more energy, I'll get more flow. But on a kind of a steam boiler system like this, where the, where the downstream plants are kind of using a fixed amount of steam, so they are controlling how much steam they're using, right? It doesn't work that way. If I increase the pressure, they will all just close down their valves because their target is getting more... Uh, this is almost like if you shower in the morning and you get different water pressure from the municipality, right? You are determining how much flow you're using. If the water pressure goes down, you'll open the tap. So... You, maybe for a very small time, when the water, if the water pressure were to suddenly increase, you'd get a little bit more flow, but then you'd, you'd move back. And this is why I can confidently say that something that takes the steam flow and changes the pressure, or changes the Q, is feed forward. Why? Because it's not reading back. It's looking at that one variable and changing this other variable and not caring what happens. Right? Because these things are not causally coupled. The energy does not couple to the flow. And so this is a feed-forward strategy. But it's very, very hard, initially, to force yourself to reason about the information causality instead of the flow. So we'll talk about this a little bit later in a TUT. Uh, there's a TUT problem in the textbook that is also built around the same idea, but in a slightly simpler form. Um, I'm looking forward to a lot of uh, participation during the tutorial later today. See you there. Remember to bring your laptops. I will have lots of power cords, uh, so just arrive in the venue ready to play. <laughs>